All right, we're getting ready to rock on. Um, so we promised you an amazing panel for this um, for this discussion. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to invite our moderator today, who is Doug Guernsey, the Chief Operating Officer of Guernsey Inc. So Doug, I'm going to hand it over to you and you can introduce the panel. Hello everyone, and, and just to be clear that I'm not part of that amazing panel, I am the moderator. Uh, uh, thank you. And, and I'll emphasize the moderate part in moderator. Um, it certainly has been an eventful past several months. Uh, any change in administration brings a mountain of expectation, and certainly this one is no different, and more so. And there's been plenty of drama, uh, but we need to separate ourselves from that for the sake of this discussion and focus only on the business insights and the economy and our nonpartisan effort. And I need to survey the crowd for potential threats here, so I think we're okay there. Um, so here we are, and the question is now what? What can we expect to happen with the economy and the impact on us individually, community, and for our businesses? There's a variety of perspectives in the audience today, and there should be something pertinent for everyone. Good insight for business, and things that are just good to know. We've broken the panel discussion down into uh, three areas, serviced by the three panel experts. Uh, global implications, impact on banking and regulations, and finally, anticipated effect on government contractors in the Northern Virginia area. And here are a few observations um, about each of those categories from the moderate moderator. Um, the global view hinges on the term globalization and how it would impact us and what the Trump administration proposes to do in an attempt to constrict the effects of globalization. What are the implications of a more separated America uh, that would endeavor to bring back manufacturing industries and include new tariffs on imported goods. As consumers, do we consider are the days of the $379.99 um, UHD 55 inch LED TV over? And, and, and by the way, that is a real bargain. I looked it up. It's a Best Buy and it's a Westinghouse. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not a name brand TV, but, but what would you want for $379.99? Um, turning to the national banking and regulatory industries, being a small family-owned business, we are interested in the fate of our particular domain. Over the past 46 years of operation, we have witnessed entire industries serviced by family-owned businesses decimated by the introduction of Wall Street funding. These would include grocery, hardware, and office supply businesses. Banking has also seen its share of roll-ups as well. This is all in the interest of the mindset that bigger is better, which might include um, entities that become too big to fail. Small business has historically been a significant source of innovation and employment, but the small business sector continues to struggle post-recession with startup businesses losing ground to small businesses closing at one, one point. Will the proposed fewer regulations and lower corporate tax rates induce more people to take those calculated risks to open new businesses? Culturally, are we outgrowing small business much as we had with manufacturing? Will the reintroduction of manufacturing cause a revival of small towns and also small businesses to serve those communities? As we look at our local region, the third category, we are very interested in what the size and scope of the federal government will be. For the most part, our geographical area is somewhat insulated from economic downturns that affect the rest of the country, except for the reverse condition that occurred with sequestration. It could be asserted that everyone in our area works for the federal government in some manner because it's so thoroughly integrated. Will the buildup of the Defense Department offset the reduction in other areas and keep our region in balance? By the way, these questions were rhetorical and not necessarily the material that will be covered by the panel, but when it comes to Q&A and you want to 
ask those questions. I'll make sure that, that the panel covers them. And now on to the panel. We indeed have an outstanding trio of presenters. And to start out with the global category, I'd like to introduce Michael Pacalico, who is Chief uh, Executive Office of, of Monticello. I wanted to make sure I got that right, because it's Monticello, Monticello, and you informed me that that's Jefferson's version, Monticello, capital. Um, he's also Chairman of the Board of Enterprise Applications, Inc., and Managing the Partner of Special Investigations Limited, a decorated Navy pilot and retired commander. He has chaired several companies, including Air Devel Europa in Luxembourg and Saudi Arabia, Theramunix Pharmaceuticals in Philadelphia, and Advanced Environmental Resources in Reston. Mike is on the National Association of Corporate Directors Teaching Faculty for Corporate Governance. He is also one of our original Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce Dulles 28 benefactors. In February, his essay, The Businessman President, published in the Global Politics and Strategy Journal Survival by London's International Institute for Strategic Studies, gained international recognition in the media for his analysis of the Trump administration from a business perspective. President Trump, Pacalico wrote, is at ease with disruptions in a way that corporate leaders generally never become. We can imagine that he now means to do so in America's service for the creation of American value in the global marketplace. Welcome, Michael. Can you get us started by placing today's discussion in a global context and tell us more about the Wharton graduate? You bet. Good morning, or good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, but I want to begin since we talked about the article that I published in Survival, I want to put it back in political science context to begin our discussion of globalization. And I want to quote a Harvard political scientist. Trump's capture of the Republican nomination was the triumphal moment of Breitbart in American politics. One might say that it was an accident in that it was out of scale with right-wing Republican strength and could happen only because of a series of failures and misadventures among moderate Republicans, which are not likely to recur. But in another sense, it was far from accidental. It resulted from the chronic, frustrating impotence of the party and from the efficient organization that the right wing had quietly built up inside it. Pretty interesting commentary, right? Okay, that was actually Richard Hofstadter in a lecture at Harvard University in January of 1965. I substituted the word Trump for Goldwater and Breitbart for pseudo-conservative. And I wanted to show you in Clemenceau's old dictum that plus se change, plus c'est les même chose, the more things change, the more things remain the same. I also want to ask the only question here, show of hands, please. I have been in a room and interacted with Donald Trump. Show of hands. Look around, okay? Two, three people, okay? We are a sophisticated audience of bankers, business persons. We are physically, geographically located in Washington, D.C. We are political beings. We interact constantly with people. Same question, Tim Kaine. Okay? Now, the purpose of that exercise was to show you that your perceptions of Donald Trump as a leader, as our president, are all filtered through some other means than personal interaction. And I want you to keep that in mind because our role as your panelists are to be intellectual, independent, nonpartisan analysts of this phenomenon that we are now facing with how the heck are we going to do business in the era of Trump. I'm a novelist. I can't make this up. 
We are living in what the pages of survival called a disordered world. And um, if you will, I, I, um, I left a copy of this essay for all of you. But I wanted to point out to you that in order to understand President Trump, his administration, the persons around him, three factors are very important. Number one is what I've called the Wharton factor and has been all around the world. People say, oh, geez, we never thought of that, that, that persons from Wharton have a, a conceptual series of values, the creation of enduring value, uh, gaining an edge all the time and doing so entrepreneurially, enhancing of brand identification and brand equity, and using financial strategy as the primary driver of power and growth. Those are the Wharton characteristics. But to understand President Trump and his leadership style, you have to understand he is not a corporate leader. As corporations, uh, we are used to being responsible to and responsive to multiple domains all at the same time. We are responsibilitarians in the middle of lots of networks of networks. In a family business, you're responsible only to very, very few domains. Your span of control is wide, and your ability to make decisions is also broad. Much of the dissonance that we've been seeing in the last six weeks uh, into the inauguration and transition and the, and the currency is simply because of the dissonance of that family company, large and successful family company, transplanted into the federal government, which is a large woolly mammoth, to quote Henry James. So understanding that family business versus corporate, understanding Wharton, and understanding Mr. Trump's deep distrust of the political establishment, okay? Uh, what we've heard called the deep state. The Trump brand is always defined in opposition to enmity. There are not opposition. There is not adversary to be reconciled. There are enemies. If you are not with me, you are an enemy. And why should we expect any different from exactly what Mr. Trump promised in the campaign? So understanding that gives us the context in business to understand how and why he operates. The, uh, I, I should commend to you also a friend of mine, Jeff Cunningham, who is a former publisher of Forbes magazine, um, wrote a piece on LinkedIn called Sun Tzu and the Trump Doctrine. Please look it up. It was published on the 2nd of March, uh, about six days ago. Uh, and he uh, wrote very, and, and by the way, um, uh, Cunningham knows Trump personally. I do not. I've met him. Uh, Trump will read what you want, will make you happy, sad, humiliated, or popular. Watch his actions, not his pronouncements. The pronouncements are not the policy. The action, often the action below the surface, are what's important. He will chum the waters. His opponents don't know what to be uh, doing. They don't know what to defend. They don't know where to attack because they are always several moves behind. He plays head games always. This is why you're constantly hearing, oh, uh, uh, Phil Zambardo, the, the, you know the Stanford prison experiment? Um, that psychologist is still working. This morning, he wrote in Psychology Today's blog, oh, this is an incredibly terrible mental illness. Well, what I, what I submit to you it is more likely a very, very carefully managed head game. Um, let me give you an example. During the campaign, what did we hear about? The wall, right? And just as Mr. Trump said in his at rallies, I'm going to ask you, who's going to pay for the wall? OK, now, when that happened, we were watching our press, but Enrique Peña Nieto, the president of Mexico. How many of you could, could have named the president of Mexico? OK. Um, now, Peña absolutely went crazy in terms of his political reaction. 
absolutely not, this will never happen, not one dime, and went on a speaking spree throughout Mexico, thus essentially painting himself in the corner. In other words, he's now faced with a contradiction. If he backs off this incredibly hard position he's made, he's a political weakling and committing political suicide. On the other hand, if he doesn't come to some accommodation with a trade imbalance in, uh, and a, uh, a change in the United States relationship, he is undercutting his own economy with its number one trading partner. In essence, Mr. Trump, by taking this chum in the water to Mexico, the wall, Mexico will pay for it, has now put his opponent in a position that eventually Pena or his successor will be coming to some accommodation. And this is a pattern that Trump, the businessman, has done for 50 years in business. Why would we expect anything? How many people think a 70-year-old businessman is going to change fundamentally the way he operates just because he has a new job? Please keep that in mind. Now, as to the global environment, let me make a couple suggestions about what I think is happening in the global economic outlook. Uh, first of all, we are now uh, maybe 20 days from the end of the first economic quarter of the Trump administration, that in which the administration took office. The big picture is in 2017, calendar year slant fiscal year 2017, um, we are going to continue our era of moderate modest economic growth. Um, my guess is that the rate of increase in growth, that is, for those of you mathematicians here, the third differential of growth, um, uh, Professor, you, you know what I'm talking about, most of you do, uh, will in fact retreat and slow a bit. So you're going to have some growth uh, in economic uh, development, but it will not be as at, at greater rate as in 2014 through 16 maybe about 2% GDP growth uh, in the United States. Some rising United States interest rates, we know that as well, but remember, internationally, that's combined with a much stronger dollar than we've had in about the last four years. Um, that means credit problems for the emerging national economies, the market economies uh, where we would expect to see some growth uh, not the, the major economies of Europe, which have their own problems, but the economic uncertainty that derives from and devolves after U.S. political uncertainty means there's going to be a general risk aversion in many of our trading partners, and that's going to be exacerbated by the return, as I wrote in Survival, of uh, tariffs into the arsenal of United States um, uh, foreign and economic policy. Now that's, that's a very mixed message, but I want to explain one more thing that we ought to think about. Let's look at what our own strengths and weaknesses are as a nation that are, are really beyond Mr. Trump or even our now unified Republican government. The strengths are that we are the beneficiaries of a continuing strong, slow recovery. Now, enduring recoveries from big recessions or depressions generally come about from a long-term and slow recoveries. We have low structural unemployment, below what we economists call the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. But we haven't yet completely factored in discouraged workers and early retirees and underemployed workers, which is a very difficult economic measure. Um, I'm of the belief that there are uh, significant measures of that beyond the manufacturing economy and that it is encroaching in our service economy. But wages have been rising for educated workers uh, significantly since 2014 over the last uh, three years, and I expect that to continue. Remember that we are the innovation leader of the world. 
we are now reaching energy independence, which some of you are old enough to recall 10 years ago, that was our big concern. My God, our dependence on Middle East oil, on the commoditization economics of the petroleum market, it is going to put us under like Japan and its lost decades. Um, we do most of our trade with Canada and Mexico. Um, uh, by the way, a prediction, I expect that some form of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, will reemerge. Um, frankly, its, uh, its letters are TPP. We can call it the Trump something or other, and it can come right back. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, the reality is nobody's read the 40,000 pages of that document, so that a lot of it can still survive. And again, that's a factor that is an expectation of Mr. Trump as a leader. There will be a repackaging and a rebranding, as we're seeing today with health care. Um, finally, remember, we are the largest source of consumer demand in the world, and our currency is the key currency of the world. We're also the Saudi Arabia of gluten. We are the providers of wheat to the world. Our agricultural economy is extraordinary. These strengths of the United States are great. Our weaknesses, by the way, productivity growth has been slowing since 2004. Um, uh, those of you that, we have many commercial bankers in here, uh, we are still low in terms of our property, plant, and equipment investments, uh, quite low despite the availability of cheap money. Uh, companies are making do longer uh, beyond the depreciable life cycle of equipment that they should be replacing. Less educated workers have seen stagnant and receding wages. Our government debt is pretty high. Uh, we're right now uh, over 20 trillion. Our debt is 106.5% of GDP. But to put that in context, um, ours is not out of line in all the OECD developed uh, democracies and economies. Our total debt, however, that is the debt of commercial debt plus government debt, relative to other nations, public and private, we're way down. So it is a mixed message and it's a good one. Let me give you my outlook very briefly in navigating business. Chaos is opportunity. Uh, agile businesses are going to win, those that can change, pivot, and change. This is the rise of the American Mittelstand. Uh, it's a German word that, that essentially means those companies that aren't real small and they aren't real big. You heard this uh, from Mr. Guernsey. Um, keep in mind, you're in the bubble. You are distorted. Your view of reality is distorted by us being in Fairfax. Focus on firm behavior, not on presidential behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, I'll have to say uh, that, that the article he wrote is very, very good. Um, I would uh, recommend that you read it. Uh, make sure you have a dictionary close by. Um, I don't know if I understood the whole article, but I'll tell you my vocabulary did increase quite a bit. <laughs> Our next panelist is Jeff Dick, Chairman and CEO of Main Street Bank Shares, Inc. and Main Street Bank. And I want to ask him, Jeff, to focus on a national perspective on the topic. Jeff is being considered as a nominee for the Federal Reserve Board's community banking seat in the Trump administration. If anybody has any influence on that process, I'm sure you'd appreciate that good word. Um, Jeff has held leadership positions with the Virginia Bankers Association and the National Independent Community Bankers of America. In previous positions, he worked at the Office of the Comptroller of Currency and has served as a, an advisor to the UK Financial Services Authority. Jeff, how might policy changes impact the banking regulation industry sectors? Jeff Dick. Thank you, Doug. So I was uh, practicing this presentation in front of my smart TV, so some of you may have seen this already. <laughs> it's time to go back in the way back time machine, because I found that oftentimes, especially in banking right now, we really have to go back before we can come forward. And I'm going to go way back in time. Uh, 
1929, and perhaps at a time when Dave Cordingly wasn't in banking yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to cost me lunch. Um, Wall Street, First City National Bank, Sunshine, Charlie Mitchell. Sunshine Charlie would sell anybody a security for any reason, and it doesn't even matter if the company exists anymore. You'll just get it at a discount. <laughs> so uh, you know, during that time in banking in the United States, there was, there was regulation, but it was really not much regulation at all. It wasn't enforced. Sunshine Charlie was doing his level best, making a lot of money. Uh, he was off on vacation on or about October 24th, and of course, that's when uh, Black Thursday hit. Came back to the country, found out that everything in, had really uh, obviously fallen. Sunshine Charlie still made a million dollars that year, and unfortunately, he, he forgot to pay the IRS anything. So uh, he was indicted, went to prison, and because of those wonderful acts and probably a few more other bad actors during that time, um, the Banking Act of 1934 came to be. The uh, Glass-Steagall Act was introduced, which separated, put an iron curtain sort of in between investment banking activity and commercial banking, created the FDIC, and banking would never be the same again. So coming forward, 1971, some of the people in the room remember when Richard Nixon was president and he um, went away from the gold standard. Not a lot of, of uh, hoo-ha in that uh, time frame, but in 1980s, we had the SNL crisis. And the SNL crisis begot Fiducia and FIREA, the FDIC Improvement Act and the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act. And um, so you'll see the trend uh, that started around the time of Sunshine Charlie, that everything, every time there was a bad actor in the crowd, new regulation, which impacted the entire population, uh, we would hope to think that not all those people were bad actors, um, but, but it, it, it furthered the cause. Um, <clears throat> so um, President Clinton uh, is in office, 1999, a little bit of uh, sunshine comes our way and the Glass-Steagall Act is repealed. And of course that doesn't do much for the community banking sector, but for the large bank sector that allows them to start getting involved, finding new revenue streams and, and finding opportunities for proprietary trading, for uh, taking positions for hedging uh, commercial loans with electricity derivatives and you name it, they'll, they'll do it. So uh, that was a good thing. December in 2008, of course, we're all privileged to remember this time very, very, uh, very well. The worst recession in our history, uh, and it was caused by our wonderful friends in the mortgage banking industry. Uh, President and Congress attacked the banking industry. Oh, not, not, yeah, not our mortgage bankers today. Uh, as I said before, there are bad actors everywhere. So the President and Congress attacked the banking industry vehemently. And of course, at that point in time, the word bank became a four-letter word. So during that time, what happened? Lehman Brothers failed. The Bank of America buys Merrill Lynch. The AIG, the insurance company, is nationalized. Bank of America is forced nearly at gunpoint to buy Countrywide. J.P. Morgan Chase is forced to buy Washington Mutual. And then IndyMac is bought by One West. So um, one failure, a lot of uh, forced mergers, um, a lot of bad actors amidst the, those crowds, and uh, not one executive of the large banks that caused these issues, or the large entities that caused these issues, paid one dollar in a fine, or spent one day you know, behind bars. So, um, you know, that's probably started before then, but became sort of the too big to fail, right? It's all familiar in everybody's vernacular. Now we'll come fast forward to July 28th, 2010. Not the best day in history. Um, Democrat administration, Democrat Congress, Dodd-Frank is passed without a single Republican vote. This is gonna be important in the theme later. 2,300 pages of riveting diatribe, not really hitting the mark. 
Um, thus far, the Dodd-Frank Act has been translated into about probably more than 15,000 pages of regulation for the financial industry in this country. Dodd-Frank, what does it do? Uh, I think the subtitle for Dodd-Frank ought to be How to Fight the Last War, probably resonates. Um, increasing banks' capital reserves a lot. And that does an impact the large banks and the community banks. Enhanced liquidity standards, more of the banks' money needs to stay liquid for purposes of, uh, you know, emergency purposes or other daily purposes. Heightened regulatory standards, the large banks are, are forced into, banks over $50 billion are what they determine as large banks here, are forced to go through stress testing exercises to see what happens in a situation not unlike the recession. Heightened, uh, wait, uh, they created GSIBs, government loves acronyms, the global um, significantly imp important banking institutions. Um, they, GSIBs need even more capital. Uh, we added the Volcker Amendment. Paul Volcker, former Fed chairman, comes back into view. Um, Volcker Amendment is sort of a Glass-Steagall light. It prohibits, again, proprietary trading in the large institutions. Added the Durbin Amendment. Durbin Amendment um, set, uh, requires the Fed to set ceilings for interchange. And uh, while we're at it, why don't we force the community banks to follow the same capital standards as the Basel uh, Commission indicates, which is Basel was put in place. Um, the Basel Accord is for the largest banks in the world. It's meant to sort of you know, put the large banks uh, in, in a, on a level playing field in uh, the United States, if you don't know it, is the only, we're the only country that has a community banking system. Most other countries have, some of the lesser developed countries have a, uh, a sovereign banking system, and most of the larger other developed countries and, and, and others have just a, a sort of a dozen you know, banks in, in the country. So we are the only bank in, in, in the United States right now. There's still about 6,000 financial institutions. Um, Basel was meant, again, to, to deal with the, the largest institutions. There was nothing in Basel in, during the discussions or otherwise that really focused on community banks in the United States. So um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, established the Financial Stability Oversight Committee, FSOC, and they're responsible for the strategically important financial institutions. So if you're not a GSIB, you can still be a CIFI. So there's still an opportunity. They require more capital as well. And I'm like, saving the, the best for, almost the best for last, and that was the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Board, the CFPB. So um, we now have a government agency that has a czar. Um, every other government agency, certainly in the financial world, uh, on, the, on the top of the, the food chain, there's a, a commission, a board or something that uh, determines, uh, sort of has the ultimate say so. But in this case, that individual is appointed by the president. And uh, as you've seen in the media so far, is not even able to be sort of unappointed by the next president. and. Uh, doesn't answer to anyone. I just realized that this is being recorded, so Bob Ganji told me to say that. Um, <laughs> so we'll still digress a little bit more. Um, mainly staffed by litigation attorneys. Isn't that friendly? Um, every other regulatory agency is staffed mainly by examiners that come out and determine what you're doing. The day that the CFPB was organized and opened, it had more litigation attorneys than any of the other regulatory entities. And uh, it is meant to protect the nation's consumers. Things like payday loans, uh, money service businesses, title loan companies, that's eh, too hard. Um, easier to pick on banks that are already regulated and you know it's kind of the low hanging fruit on the tree. So that's where they've been focused. You haven't really seen anything on payday lending or anything like that. So the CFPB, of course, is also appropriately building a Taj Mahal. Renovations in excess of $216 million on a building that they paid $150 million for. 
300,000 square feet. Do we, if we have any realtors in the audience, that renovation is $720 a square foot. Uh, Czar Corduroy was in front of the, uh, I'm not sure which committee, uh, if it was the Senate Banking Committee or not, but um, testifying and, and one of the senators asked him about the cost of the building and he said to them, that's not your business. <laughs> so um, that's what we're dealing with in, in the regulatory space. Uh, and I guess lastly, when we're looking at Dodd-Frank and thanks to Rom, never let a good crisis go to waste, Emmanuel, the, uh, an additional 100 unrelated items were attached to the Dodd-Frank bill. I'm not gonna go into those. So um, we are now, since, uh, since the we came out of recession in the longest recovery in the United States that we've had for a long time. Um, we're gonna fast forward to President-elect uh, Trump and a Republican Congress. Uh, Stephen, the Fed hater Mnuchin, appointed as Treasury Secretary. The end of oppression, bankers shouting from the mountaintops, free at last, free at last. Reform the oppressive CFPB, repeal FSOC, reform the Fed, revise Dodd-Frank, repeal Volcker, repeal Durbin, bankruptcy not bailouts for the large institutions, regulatory burden relief. But then, President Trump gave his sort of grown-up speech last week. And what we found is he, he focused on three things. He focused on revision of our health care, immigration control, and infrastructure, putting a trillion dollars into the infrastructure into the United States. Not Dodd-Frank. <laughs> well, crud. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to bring this about to sort of modern day. What does this mean to the people in, in the room today, aside from the bankers? What you need to know, I, I, I laugh, because I grew up in an agriculturally oriented environment. And if you saw a farmer, and you asked that farmer, how, is, how are things going today? Awful. You know, crops are bad. You know, it, it's just in the vernacular. You've got to sort of complain about things. And I know when you talk to bankers sometimes, obviously you heard a, a tiny bit of negativity in my <laughs> message today. Um, but the thing is, what does excessive capital requirements actually mean to the people in this room? Well, that means that banks don't necessarily have as much money to lend to you as they would like to lend to you. What, uh, uh, when we, we look at restrictive, uh, regulators are now putting out guidance. It's not law, it's not regulation, but saying that, so for example, in our market, commercial real estate is very, very, uh, is a big business for the community banks. But the regulators are saying we can only allow so much of our capital to more commercial real estate. So if you're in the market to get your commercial real estate, you know, investor property financed, you might find that either you don't have quite as much competition as you once did, or maybe there's nobody that's ready to stand ready to, to finance that building for you because the regulators have put a cap on what banks can do. Um, there's a, uh, uh, you know, right now a cap on interchange. Um, I know some of you might think, oh, those horrible banks, you know, they get to make money on every debit or credit card transaction. But I want you to think for a second, who built those systems? Who built those rails that debit and credit and everything else roll on? That's what, the, that's what all of that money goes towards. And so if that's, if that's restricted, how much of that money is going to be available for future advancement and payments and you know, faster payments is, is huge in, in society today. We're trying to look for better ways to, you know, uh, sort of sunset the check, um, you know, make everything payable by your smartphone and all those types of things. But that costs money for R&D and everything. And if we have, you know, if, if you're uh, any bakers in the room, think about what it would cost to, uh, if, if, if you could only charge so much for a loaf of bread. So regulated, regulatory overkill, just kind of bringing it all full circle, leads to frustrated bankers. Frustrated bankers means more banks entering the M&A environment, 
and then fewer banks overall. So I think, uh, you know, I, I think what you'll find as you go forward that hopefully we'll see some action, forward, forward action in the Trump administration to sort of right some of these things so we'll have a better environment for everybody to, to bank in. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Certainly a lot of regulations. Amazing that banks can do anything. Hope Main Street Bank does mortgages, because you might need that <laughs> if ever you want to buy a house. Um, some interesting uh, scenarios also to contemplate there, Jeff. Um, our wrap-up speaker is Dr. Terry Clower, professor of public policy at the George Mason University. A few years ago, he replaced Dr. Stephen Fuller as director of Mason's Center for Regional Analysis, which provides economic and public policy research services to sponsors in the private, nonprofit, and public sectors. Prior to joining GMU, he was director for the Center of Economic Development and Research at the University of North Texas. We're going to double task you, Terry. Would you talk about what the Trump administration means for the world of government contractors? and then frame this whole conversation in terms of how these changes might affect Northern Virginia businesses. Terry? All right, so I'm gonna be mindful. I've noticed lots of people asking questions, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. I, last week I was uh, in West Africa doing a bit of, of work, and on the way back, somewhere about the 10th or 11th hour of being on an airplane, I achieved clarity. Uh, and because Eileen had talked to me about doing this thing, I always do whatever Eileen tells me, and so I'd been thinking about this presentation. And what I came to the conclusion is, I don't have a freaking clue what the Trump administration is going to do because we don't know which of his policies are actually going to turn into law and, and which spending programs are going to happen yet. What we are in now is an era of uncertainty that we have not had since we were in the depths of the Great Recession. We just simply don't know. And what is the natural reaction to being in a period of uncertainty is you cut back on your spending. So what I would see going forward, quite frankly, and I, I'm going to fill this in a little bit, but unlike a Agatha Christie novel, we, you know, we can go ahead and tell you what the end is, is that, look, there are opportunities out here. But our growth is going to be, as suggested earlier, is going to be slow. I think we actually have some opportunity in this region to outpace national growth for this next year. Uh, but I do think that we are seeing some indications of slowdown. Uh, my predecessor, Dr. Fuller, is actually starting to predict recession coming. And of course, I will tell you that yes, there's a recession coming. And if I actually knew the date of it, then I'd make a hell of a lot of money and I'd share it with you, right? <laughs> but but you know, so the point is, is that we do have some, some challenges out there. Let me just take this down into contract. You guys know this story. You've probably have seen our presentations before. And if you haven't, you can go to our website and, and see this stuff. But we hit in terms of procurement, government procurement spending in this region, our peak in 2010 at something like about $82.4 billion. That's a lot of money. But what happened then is we saw the effects of the Budget Control Act sequestration, and over a period of about three and a half, four years, we went down to $69.7 billion. So we took about $13 billion worth of spending, government spending, out of this region. And as the economists will say, a billion here and a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about some real money, right? And, and so we're, we're looking at this opportunity, you know, we're seeing this go down. And indeed, with that coupled with the effect of the government shutdown, uh, that wasn't very long, but certainly took some activity out of the region, we had a recession, a little mini recession in this region. So what's been going on since then? Well, we have certainly seen a little bit of a recovery in government spending. But it really hasn't been that great. Uh, we were in fiscal 16 at somewhere about 73 billion, so certainly off the bottom. But that's still not inflation adjusted, a level that's roughly about nine billion dollars short of what we hit at the peak. Having said that, though, and this is a thing that's been kind of interesting that we're watching, professional and business services employment, which is where you usually see most of our, our government contractors, has actually since 2000, the end of 2014, been on about a two-year tear now. We have been gaining jobs. Last year, we added something in order of about 25, 26,000 jobs in that sector alone in this region. 
So now part of you could say that, well, you've heard us all say that we need to be separated a little bit from government. We need to see other private sector industries growing, and, and maybe that has been the case somewhat. We don't have the data yet that's going to tell me that that's exactly the case. But the point is, is that we are still largely dependent. In 2010, uh, dependent on federal government, sorry. In 2010, we were about 40% of our regional economy was directly or indirectly dependent on federal government. We are probably below that now. Uh, we don't have the data yet to be able to disaggregate it that well, but we're still probably still in that mid-30s, at you know 36%, 37%, something like that. So we're still a company town, guys. You know, and, and that's just that's kind of the way it is at the moment. We're seeing some opportunities elsewhere, though. So. One of the things that we have that we have actually started to see is federal government employment up until our recent announcement starting to grow again. You know, we had dropped a good bit in employment down here. We had lost something in the neighborhood over about a two-year period from 2012 into 2014, about 15,000 federal jobs. And that, was mo that wasn't layoffs, that was attrition, not, re not replacing people. So in effect, a little bit of a, of a hiring freeze effectively though it was not a formal one. And those jobs are important because those federal jobs average about $100,000 a year salary. So you're starting to talk about a lot of money coming out. I want you also to think about in the effects of just simply freezing. So let's say that we have a, a, a wage freeze and we say that the normal cost of living adjustments that federal employees usually get most years, we don't do that for a year. We just say, nope, your salary's frozen. That's the effectively taking about $900 million worth of income out of the region. So you start then with the multipliers. You know how those multipliers work? You hear about those? Unfortunately, multipliers work going up and they also work going down. So you, there are some, there's some challenges in there. Yet, with that, I still can find some reason to be optimistic. CBO projections are saying that we are going to have some increase in spending, both in terms of defense spending and non-defense discretionary spending. Now, certainly, much depends on what they do with the Budget Control Act. The Budget Control Act is supposed to disappear in 2021. It probably, you know, are we going to repeal it ahead of that? That would be a big difference in what we're on what our outlook is. Uh, I do think I've been most, I've been greatly amused. Uh, at the last couple of weeks because, you know, we're going to ramp up defense spending, we're going to do all of this stuff, and it actually amounts to about a 3% increase. But if you, think, if you think about defense spending, you know, $750 billion or so, so 3% is still a lot of opportunity. And the good news for us in this region is whether you use that money to build airplanes, maybe in Washington, or you build ships down in Newport News, or you help support a base that's over in Okinawa or something or another, we get to take a little off the top in this region because we have our defense contractors headquartered here. So that, that's, that's all right. That creates some opportunities for us. Another one of the opportunities that I want to talk about a little bit is information security, cybersecurity, if you will. So I did a little experiment. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, out of all of their job occupations that they list, about 1,700 different occupations they show, have one that actually is pretty well tied specifically to cybersecurity. It's called an information security analyst. All right. So in terms of the in terms of the metropolitan areas in this country, let me just hear, who do you think are probably the five areas that have the most information security analysts by count? Who's number one? California, so Silicon Valley? Yeah. yeah. Who's number two? Ashburn, <laughs> metro area. Let me give it a little definition here. Metro areas are more than the city, right? It's uh, the whole region. So, okay, DC, number two. Anybody else? Number three? Seattle. Seattle. Boston. Boston. New York. New York. Okay, here we go. DC is number one. About 10,000 people hold those jobs, that one particular category, right? New York is number two. New York is number two with about 50% of the number of people in that job that DC has, a little over 5,200. Uh, number three, Dallas-Fort Worth. Number four, Chicago. Number five, Boston. So I, I haven't mentioned Silicon Valley yet. Where does San Francisco, Oakland fall? Number nine. 
number nine. Now, why is that? Well, the reason I figure is those hippies can't pass a drug test, so you can't have a drug test, right? <laughs> That remains one of our biggest options, our, big, our, our biggest opportunities, I think. I will point out a challenge, though. Have you noticed, and, and this never makes the big headlines, but buried someplace about page 27 in the Business Journal, you'll have a little note that our major defense contractors have all shed their commercial application sectors in cybersecurity. They've spun them off. Well, why is that? Well, in part, I suspect, I don't know this, so I'm just going to speculate, uh, I suspect that a lot of it has to do that they want to concentrate on federal government because if you're applying for a federal government contract, you say, well, I want this much money and the federal government gives it to you. If I'm doing it in the commercial sector, all of a sudden I got to compete with everybody else doing it. The illustration I use is let's think if you have a company car. If I'm sitting there and I'm selling to the federal government, I look out there and I say, I've got a car out there that's got 80,000 miles on. I'm just going to put a car in the contract because I need another car. If I'm competing against private sector businesses, I'm going to say, I can get another 180,000 miles out of that car. It's staying in there, and I'm lowering the cost of my contract proposal. You know, so it's a different mindset that we have going into that. I do think we have some challenges. So let me just wrap it up with this so we can get to your questions. First of all, I do not see a huge ramp up in the federal procurement spending, but at the end of the day, that's a $72 billion market. Go compete for it. If you're a banker, talk to your customers that are in that sector and say, go for it, buddy. Understand, there's some, there's some you know, cost of doing it. Sorry, I printed this out and made it too small. Uh, <laughs> we do have a good bit of uncertainty that, that's going to abound by it, but I think we can adapt to that uncertainty. I think that there are certainly the market opportunities. I think, the, as I noted, the cybersecurity is going to present some. Federal spending, okay, I'm going to step out way out on the limb here, but it's a pretty thick limb. Federal spending is going to increase. We are going to have lots of teeth gnashing, and we're going to have lots of stuff said back and forth, but the fact of the matter is that we are going to send, see federal spending increase, some, and it's going to be some targeted. We don't have earmarks anymore, but we're going to do our best equivalent of that kind of stuff because I can promise you that spending is going to continue to help protect the political interest of the parties in place. The Republicans don't want to lose in the midterms, and they certainly don't want to go into a presidential election with us moving into a recession in this nation, and so we'll use the Keynesian model and just spend our way into economic prosperity, right? Until it collapses with massive debts and deficits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I do think, though, we have a significant challenges facing us. Our big challenge is our labor market. Because who's going to be our cybersecurity workers? Our cybersecurity workers are largely, I'm sorry guys, those of you that hair, share a hairline with mine, it's going to be the younger workers, the millennials. And so what are we facing here if we have that? We're sec you know, by many measures, we have the worst traffic conditions in the country. If you look in terms of commute, 17% uh, of our workers commute more than 60 minutes to get to a job. That's two hours out of their day. The only place worse is New York, of course, and then you think that people live in Philadelphia and take the train up, you know, kind of thing. Uh, I have no idea why. There's some Darwinism thing going on there that I don't understand. But the other piece is if you think the millennials are forming families, okay, can you afford a house in this market? I have a, my deputy director has a, a child that's about one year, three or four months now, $20,000 a year they're paying for childcare, right? So if you're doing that cybersecurity work, do you have to be in the office or can you be sitting there, you know, doing your work at home? Where are you going to be based? We have got to come up with the solutions. We have to figure out a way to fund Metro so that they can be there for that. We have to come up with issues about workforce level housing for our workers because we have deals that we lose in this community because the companies can't afford to pay their workers and be competitive high enough to where they can live near their workplace. So we have some challenges here to face. Having said all that though, we got some pretty damn smart people around here. I think we can probably figure out a way to compete, and I'll share with this. We are very, we are much better, and I, 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 I challenge you to go look up some uh, research done by Jonathan Aberman, that we actually perform 
very well in entrepreneurship in this region. We don't think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial, area, entrepreneurial in our nature, but we are. And so that gives us some opportunity. Now what we have to do in part is, I'll give my little peach and pander to the audience, we have to get rid of some of these bloody regulations so small banks can lend to businesses, right? All right, there we go. With that, let's move it on and get into the other questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Terry. It, the script says, all right, lots of questions. And actually, there are lots of questions. And I'll start with the ones that I can read. Um, Val, thanks for asking this. Uh, Bill Gates recently said that a robot that takes the place of a human should be taxed in some way. Please discuss and state if you agree or disagree. <laughs> Hey, Mike. All right, Terry. Yeah, go for it. So uh, I'll tell you what. We it is taxed. Most states have capital. You know, some form of a capital gain. You know, a payment on capital gains. Now, for an economic development deal, you might get that waived, but you see that. But guys, that is one of our other challenges. We couldn't go, Eileen wouldn't give me the time to go over every challenge that we have. But you know what our big challenge now is? It's not that we haven't seen the manufacturing workers be displaced by technology. We've had that, that's done. What's coming next is your mid-grade white collar worker that gets replaced by technology. And that's the one we're not, we're not at all ready for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, there already is the mechanisms for doing that. Okay. Mike, you have a comment? Yeah, I want to remark that uh, every time I hear someone with a net worth higher than mine talking about how certain things need to be taxed, uh, my libertarian instincts immediately kick in. Uh, but Thanks for that nonpartisan yeah, comment, exactly. Mike. I appreciate that. <laughs> but uh, first of all, Pocalico's rule of taxation is this. Whatever it is you want less of, that's where you apply the tax. So if you want less innovation in robotics, mm -hmm. start taxing it. Yeah, uh, it's not a good idea, and I'd be happy to tell Mr. Gates that. He hasn't asked me, though. OK, <laughs> we'll work on that one. Um, next question, what are your expectations for the infrastructure program, uh, specifically for bridges, the Potomac River crossing, and private-public partnerships? Okay, uh, two things. First of all, if we're going to drain the swamp, we don't need the other bridge. <laughs> you know, if we, if we lose 200,000 jobs in the area, you know, we just take them all off. That. Now, it, the thing is, I, I remain highly skeptical that the tax credit kind of program is, is going to stimulate private sector investment in, to the degree of, you know, a trillion dollars over some period of time. Um, I am, though, a big proponent that, guys, we are underinvested in our transportation infrastructure. It certainly detracts from our overall growth. Suck it up. You know, there's one of the things that I tell you is that in certain respects, you know, we talk about the greatest generation, the ones that, you know, fought in World War II, you know, my parents and some of your grandparents and all this kind of stuff, and they sacrificed to do that. Our sacrifice may be we may have to live with the notion of higher taxes to get our structure back mm -hmm. where it needs to be. Now, I'm all about, though, finding some efficiencies that you, you, know, you don't have to do it all just on the top and all that. But this thing about don't tax me, don't tax me, don't tax me, and then turn around and complain about hitting a pothole, come on. Jeff, anything? OK. Um, are you concerned that costs of goods imported from countries that have filled the shelves of Walmart and Kmart and dollar stores? I guess you're not concerned about it. I'm concerned. Remember that TV? $379.95? I'm going to be there. I have an inalienable right to pay $400 for a big screen TV. Agreed. <laughs> right, yeah, let, me, let me address that. Um, in Look, we have socialized ourselves to a low uh, cost of consumer goods. And uh, when, you know, it, back when I was studying communist economics uh, 35 years ago, uh, there, was, uh, there was a concept uh, that measured in, in Leninist terms how long a person worked to earn a refrigerator or any durable good. 
And uh, we have taken that metric down about as far as it can go. And the reason is because of the large differential in the wage rate of labor for manufacturing within the United States uh, and that overseas. And then when you add to uh, the fully depreciable amounts of capital uh, that are invested in manufacturing uh, uh, automatically in the United States as opposed overseas, you can see why we don't have a manufacturing sector here. Um, but most of you aren't going out of your way to buy American as uh, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, most vociferous supporters of uh, Mr. Trump are, are, are saying, uh, and I don't think we can. We can't take apart the interstitial tissue of the international economy anymore, period. Thank you. Um, is the add one regulation and remove two a reasonable approach? And I can't read the second part of it. It's either a word I don't know or just one that I, I can't decipher. But, but I'll add on to this. And, and Jeff, this is for you uh, specifically. It doesn't say it, but I'm going to ask you for this. Um, it, it does seem kind of arbitrary that you add one and, and deduct two, but it should be easy to track. Uh, what about the financial regulations? And, and to put it in the context of uh, comparing it with building regulations and how uh, we have a great, great construction process. Um, isn't there a balance there between reverting to what happened in 2008 and going forward with, with deregulation and, and learning from that history? Certainly. The, the thing is, when you're looking at add one, delete two, um, you know, this country has a lot of regulations on the books. So I'm going to talk specific to banking for a moment. Um, when I started in banking in uh, 1983, you know, there was no electronic banking. You got your statement in the mail, and if, uh, you know, God forbid you happen to be gone when that statement cycle was cut, you're on vacation, you got another opportunity, and candidly, you have um, six months to dispute a transaction on your account. Dial that forward to 2017, when all your transactions show up on any device that you have within 24 hours of the time the transaction was made, but you still have six months to dispute that transaction. So that's a simple, easy answer, right? Um, you delete that regulation, and you know this is where the gamesmanship comes in. Maybe you replace it with a regulation that that modernizes that that so. You know, maybe it's really not a, a minus one, plus one, but at least it makes sense. You know, I, I go into forums um, with, with my banking uh, colleagues uh, on the payment side of things, and we're talking about you know, trying to modernize the payment system, and I sort of bring up this compliance aspect of the, of the regulation, and they first look at me like I have two heads growing out of my neck because they don't look at compliance. That's for nerds. But, yeah, um, <laughs> but that, you know, that's a simple fact. And, and so there's a lot of that kind of regulation. And cleaning that up would just be a brilliant opportunity for this country to really try to move forward. You know, and, and I think you could look at that in every industry and, and just say, OK, it's more about modernizing what's on the books slowing down Congress a little bit to say, okay, if you want to put that on the book, let's look at something that you can eliminate, and I think that's a really good thing. Okay. Um, another question, how does the federal hire freeze by the new administration affect the local small businesses? Well, at this point, not a heck of a lot. I mean, it just says that you're, you're delaying. You know, there have been federal hiring freezes in this community before, and they start doing the thing about accept. And accept is the word that every federal bureaucracy knows how to game better than anything else. So I'm, I'm, I don't know that you're going to see a, a, a big dramatic shift because of this hiring freeze. It's a temporary freeze anyhow. Mm -hmm. All right. If it turns into a permanent shift in reduction, then tell me, do we quit doing that work? Or is it supplanted with contractors? Because if it's supplanted with contractors, then the net effect is really not that much. Uh, if you have an actual reduction and you reduce, maybe it's in regulation or something else, the activities of government in this region, 
then you'd presume lower income, which has a spillover effect in the hospitality sectors, et cetera. But I think that what I'd give you about three ifs in a row there, I'm just not really expecting a whole lot. I mean, I'm a little bit of a, I guess, in a Missourian in that sense of you got to show me something on, on whether or not this hiring freeze is really going to turn into anything meaningful. I'd like to add that, uh, to my knowledge, there have been four federal hiring freezes since the Reagan administration took office. In each of them, the net effect has been an increase in displacement of government hires to the contracting sector, and that's good for everybody in the room. Okay, uh, Trump has a big agenda. Which items on his list do you think he will tra uh, tackle first, and will they be successful, and how long will they take uh, before the effects are felt in Northern Virginia? This is assuming he gets anything. Uh, you know, I, okay, that's our Connick the Magician thing. I'm thinking about, you know, Johnny Carson, though, are you old enough to remember, you know? You're dating party. yourself. Yeah, yes, I am dating myself. Uh, but dating myself to quality, how's that? There you go. Uh, but the, 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 I don't know. I, I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a swag. I, I would suspect that the economic agenda is going to be secondary. Uh, you will see some social agenda. Um, uh, you'll, you'll find him trying to fulfill his campaign promises. Uh, immigration reform is clearly going to be uh, foremost. Uh, the homeland security sector, the uh, dismantling of the administrative state, um, the diminishment of uh, interest in foreign affairs and diplomacy, uh, those matters uh, you can uh, count on a lot of attention early on in the administration. Um, uh, of course, he's going to be facing uh, his own party on con in Congress. I'm headed to Congress later this afternoon for a reception this evening. Uh, so tomorrow, if you want to call me, I'll have better <laughs> insight here. Uh, but I want to remind you that this is not a president carrying the water of the Republican or the conservative agendas. He is carrying his own agenda, and it is sui generis. That was one of the words I had to look up that was in his, uh, <laughs> in his article. Really, really unique. I think it means really unique, unique and natural state, right? I think that's what I, I remember. Um, how can our economy reasonably sustain the price tags of projects that cost in the million? What would be the driving revenues, and are they realistic? And, and I like Terry's answer where you just, what was it, suck it up? And I thought it was, that probably makes the most sense. So, um, Well, any, any movement now, what we're doing, it, this is a different realm. It is everything we are going to do in a significant infrastructure project is going to take the form of a public-private partnership in some way or another. Hmm. The, the, the day of federal government just coming in and saying we're going to spend the money, it, it, that, that's gone at yep. least for a while. I'm not going to say that you couldn't have a politic, you know, radical political change again you know, and, and get something like that. But by and large, I would argue to you that the public-private partnership is a better option. You bring, in the, you bring in government where it can with its resources, but then you bring in the smarts and the intelligence of the business community to work out a good deal. Okay. Anybody else? Um, to tag along to that, how do you see the long-term impact of the U.S. national debt? Big. Yeah, that's what I figured. Goodness. Look, at the end of the day, that's part of our party crash. And this is the thing. I, I love low taxes as much as anybody. Uh, but this thing about that I just can't make the numbers add up, that you're going to get the supply side stuff is going to replace shifting a corporate tax uh, rate from 35% to 20% to doing 10% on repatriation of funds, I mean, all this kind of stuff. I just don't see where it balances, and I could see us. And of course, you drive up the debt, that means government is competing for the dollars, and our interest rates, we add, what is it, 100 basis, 200 basis points to, to everything that we're doing, and what does that do to our growth? That's gonna slow it down. Understood. Well, um, I'd like to go ahead and thank everybody, uh, especially the panelists here.
And James, the script terminated about three sentences ago, so I'm not exactly sure where to go from there. But thank you for your questions as well. I appreciate that as well. Yeah, I know we, we have lives. We've got other, this was great stuff. This was amazing. Um, Michael, on, on Doug's recommendation, I actually got a dictionary and a thesaurus, so I think I'm good to go. Jeff, nice pajamas this morning. Awesome. Um, Terry, for you, the, um, my understanding is that we have approximately 650,000 businesses that open up in the US every year. Half of those fail in the first couple of years. In your mind, is that due just to lack of investment or lack of loans being available from the banks? Or is it due to a multitude of other things? It's a multitude of, of, of other things. Look, small, I, I love the line that politicians, that small businesses create more jobs than any other sector of the economy. Small businesses destroy more jobs than <laughs> any other sectors. In the sense, it's a churn. Right. And, and here's your deal. There is not a small business out there that willingly wants to sell to another small business. They want to sell to medium and large firms because they want certainty of payment. Right. So you, you, it is an ecosystem. You, you don't have, you, the African plains don't work if you don't have the lions and the elephants and stuff like that working. You, you know, so if everything is gazelles, you just graze it all down to nothing. Uh, and so the, the point is, is that, that there are challenges. I would argue to you that the small, the small size businesses, though, are more impacted by our local regulations, our state laws, our state taxes, our, our requirements. I mean, you want to open a business, do you have to get permission for government? I come from Texas. We don't need no stinking permission. <laughs> Start your business. Get going. Make money. You know, so I think that the small bit, and, and certainly I appreciate that the regulatory side affects the ability to lend a business, but remember that you as, as bankers are not lending to the smallest of businesses anyhow because they're too damn risky, even without Dodd-Frank. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. That was, that was my question. I just, I can't, I'm up here, I've got the mic, so I'm asking a question. Awesome. Um, listen, thanks again, guys. It, it was spectacular. Um, I'd like to thank our title sponsor once again, uh, Guernsey Inc., to our host sponsor, The Holiday Inn, Washington Dulles. Our presenting sponsors, Main Street Bank, Vibrant, TriVision, HRI Associates. Our table sponsors, the National, there's a whole list here, guys, I'm sorry. Uh, the National Conference Center, Sandy Spring Bank, Fulton Bank, and United Bank. And a big shout out to Burke and Herbert, Cardinal Bank, Freedom Banks, and Washington First. Um, thanks to you all. Um, I'm also going to recognize our 2017 partners. These are some really special people who have invested along with the Dulles Chamber in helping us be who we are. So if you don't mind, our champion partners are Main Street Bank, HRI Associates. Again, special welcome to PG and Vibrant. Glad to have you on board and try Vision. Our visionary partners are Kaiser Permanente and the Fairfax County Times. Leader Partners, the National Conference Center, Stone Spring Back Hospital Center, Dominion, Virginia Power. Our investor partners are Thompson Greenspawn, CPAs, Fairbrooks Hotels, The Connection Newspapers, Crown Plaza, Guernsey Inc., Northern Virginia uh, Community College, Cox, Access Public Affairs, United Bank, and Aeronautical Systems. Whew, it's quite the list. Listen. Thanks to everyone. Did you guys enjoy this? Was this fun? Thanks. Big round of applause for our, our panelists.